A woman in her 80s went online to research a hand cream. An alarm blared as a pop-up message flashed, urging her to call Microsoft. She called the number as the screaming alarm continued, unnerving her so much she was shaking. The ordeal led to her losing $13,000 to a tech support scam. A woman in Dayton, Ohio was clearing out her late mom's home where she found $42,000 in empty gift cards among her mom's things. Evidently, her mother had been involved in a longtime romance scam and nobody in the family knew. A woman's elderly dad in Atlanta had been caught up in an online investing scheme and had lost $70,000. At the time the woman shared her story, her dad still didn't believe he was being victimized by a scam. I'm here today to talk to you about financial crime, to talk about why we don't care enough about it, why we don't do enough about it, and the reason behind all of that. And hopefully by the end of my talk, we'll all agree that together we can do something meaningful about it. Now I've spent most of my career trying to help workers figure out how to plan and save for retirement. It's been no easy task for me or frankly for workers. Now, mind you, I'm not a financial advisor, but it was my job to translate personal financial planning jargon into something more understandable so that workers could make sound decisions on what was available to them through their employer, whether the ever diminishing traditional pension plan or a 401k type of plan. I'm still in the personal financial education arena, but my focus has turned to helping older adults protect their savings and other assets so that those assets last throughout their retirement. Again, this is no easy task for me, nor is it for millions of older adults. But the challenge isn't trying to make sense of personal finance jargon. This time, it's getting across the very real threat of financial devastation through financial crime. And by this, I mean scams. You know, the kind that often come to us through illegal robocalls warning that our car warranty is about to expire or that we neglected to pay back taxes and now the IRS is threatening jail time. Or that fascinating person that a widow in her 60s I've come to know named Kate met through a friend request on Facebook. The one who, after a number of days and conversations, suggested that Kate download an app so they could talk who over time and despite her early disinterest in a love relationship, Kate truly fell in love with. This person she met randomly by accepting his friend request on Facebook, who was a surgeon working in Iraq on a contract with the United Nations who had a little boy and a little girl. I'll come back to the story a little later. Yes, what I'm talking about today is financial crime scams. It's a crime we don't pay a ton of attention to. We tend to focus more on what we perceive as the more frightening nature of violent and property crimes. But financial crimes are a significant and growing issue that has and can continue to devastate millions of people. And for many victims, it happens at a time in their lives when they're least capable of recovering from it. Fraud losses are a bit hard to pin down, but from the lowest figure, financial crimes victims lost more than $3 billion to scams in 2020. By another measure, scam victims lost $29 billion, while still another measure pins the losses at $56 billion. $56 billion leaving our economy through scams in a single year. And understand financial scams are a scourge that know no demographic bounds. Scammers target the young and the older, the more educated and the less educated men and women, and those with money and even those without. In fact, there's ample evidence that younger people experience scams and financial loss more often than older people. But when older adults are targeted, they lose so much more. It stands to reason, right? Older adults may have saved over the course of their working lives for retirement. They have steady income from social security, maybe a pension. They may have housing wealth. All of this makes older adults of keen interest to scammers. Scammers might also calculate that older adults may be experiencing cognitive decline, making them an easier target. But research shows that while cognitive decline is sometimes a factor in losing money to a scam, it is by no means always the case. 
When it comes to scams as a society, we tend to blame victims of these crimes for becoming victims in the first place. We say the person was duped or swindled or fell for it, as if there was something the victim didn't know or didn't do that left them exposed to the crime they experienced. Now, this is far from the case with other crimes in our society. Take property crimes. If someone experiences a home burglary, it's likely their friends and family will rush to the victim's side, rightfully supporting and consoling them. The police will arrive on the scene, take a report, and launch an investigation. If the crime shows up in the news the next day, the headline might be something like, wanted Norfolk burglary suspect linked to two break-ins. The focus of the news article is on the criminal suspect and the suspect's criminal act, break-ins. Or take violent crimes. If someone gets robbed, again, family and friends flock to their sides and offer empathy and consolation, and the police take a report and investigate. And when the police find the criminal, the headline the next day might say, suspect busted for robbing 80-year-old man. Here again, the focus of the news article is on the criminal suspect and the crime of robbing. But if you're a victim of a scam, empathy and consolation are not the first things you experience. The first thing is likely self-blame. I can't believe I fell for this. How could I be so stupid? And you don't get a more empathetic response from your friends and family despite what might be their best intentions. Our knee-jerk reaction is along the lines of, you got duped with that? That's the oldest trick in the book. Or, how much money did you give them? And should there be a news story? The headline would be something like this one. Hillsborough woman bilked out of $28,950. Well, where's the criminal or the crime in this headline? They're not explicitly there. What we have is that a woman was bilked. She fell for it. She got duped. She was swindled. And as far as reporting your scam experience to the police, you may not get much empathy or even help there. The all too common response when a fraud victim contacts the police to file a report, uh, that's not a crime, it's a civil matter. Or uh, why are you calling us? You gave them your money. All too often, this adds up to a victim not even telling their loved ones what happened, let alone reporting it. We know that scams are severely underreported and it stands to reason. If a victim feels shame and humiliation, he's betting that anyone he tells from family and friends to law enforcement will just pile onto that sense of shame. One thing I believe I can say with some certainty is that while our words blame victims of financial crimes, we typically don't mean to cause harm with those words. It's simply how we've come to react to it. There's a whole host of reasons that we have this tendency to blame scam victims for the crime perpetrated against them, from our American sense of rugged individualism, our being wired to believe that the world is mostly good and that most people get what they deserve, to attribution bias, which explains how a person's internal factors and characteristics are the cause in the case of financial fraud, that the victim wasn't smart enough or let their guard down versus the victim being intentionally targeted by a criminal. Ultimately, victim blaming helps us create an illusion of invincibility, the belief that this would never happen to me. Let me share some perspective on today's scammer. While plenty of criminals work on their own to seek and destroy their next scam victim, a lot of scam activity these days perpetrated by transnational criminal enterprises that operate like businesses. They have offices and employees. They buy lead lists. They offer bonuses for the worker who make the most in a given call center shift. They have money, they have time, and they have a playbook that sets out how to get a target to become a victim. Lots of things go into the making of a successful scam, but at the base is something scammers have known since time immemorial. If you can get your target into a heightened emotional state, whether fear or excitement or even love, you have a good chance of stealing from them. It's what scammers refer to as getting their targets under the ether. Once we're in that heightened emotional state, in that ether, it's very hard to access logical thinking. 
We've heard many victims say after the fact that they felt like they were under some spell, that they just did what the person told them to do and it was like they couldn't even stop. This approach plays out regardless of how scammers seek to get to us, whether by phone, email, text, social media, or even in person. Let's get back to the online romance I started telling you about. Remember our widow Kate who ended up falling in love with the surgeon in Iraq who had the young kids? Well, those young kids reached out to her and started calling her mom. Those kids asked her to buy them gift cards so they could buy necessities, which was followed by her love interest asking for money too. He was good for it, he promised, even gave Kate access to see his American bank account that had over $2 million in it. This story goes on over many months, but tragically there was no real surgeon or real kids, and there was no happy ending. This widow, Kate, lost $39,000, all she had from her late husband's life insurance and her savings. The human toll of these financial crimes is profound. Billions of dollars are lost each year with little chance of restitution. Nearly two in three victims report experiencing a serious emotional or health impact. And sadly, thousands of victims die by suicide. I'm here today to cast a bright light on these crimes, to help grow understanding that it's criminals who are responsible for perpetrating these crimes. It is not the victim's fault. And I think we intrinsically understand that, but we get caught up in the language we've always used when talking about scams. She was duped, he got scammed, he fell for it. Most of us don't even think anything of it, it's what comes naturally. Just like 40 years ago, it came naturally to us to learn about a rape that occurred and immediately start asking questions like, well, uh, what was she wearing? Or why was she out alone at night? Instead of talking about the incident as a violent crime that a violent person committed against an innocent victim. Things changed beginning with a couple of books published in the mid seventies that drastically changed the conversation. The books demonstrated just how common rape was, and they led to an understanding that anyone could be a victim, any man could be a rapist, and that rape is not a natural part of masculinity. Or look back about 30 years ago when we began to see a culture shift to focus on preventing unnecessary and tragic suicides. In the mid-90s, a large group of loved ones of suicide victims organized, and they began to advocate for suicide prevention. This ultimately led to a national call to action to prevent suicide, which set off a dramatic growth ever since on suicide prevention. It launched programs across government, in schools, and through nonprofits. It even led to the development of a code that journalists follow to cover suicide carefully and responsibly. It is time to change our cultural narrative on blaming victims of financial crimes we have it within our power to stop our focus on a victim being, quote, duped or swindled and instead treat them with compassion and support. What if instead of saying, I can't believe you got duped or how could you fall for that? We replace that with, it's not your fault. Scammers are good at what they do. You're a victim of a crime. This isn't simply a game of semantics. Rather, I submit that changing the victim blaming narrative could have major implications from the individual to the societal. First, fraud victims will receive empathy and respect rather than scorn and humiliation. It will empower them to get angry and take action rather than hide in shame, and more of this crime will be reported. Family relationships won't be strained or even destroyed when we stop seeing the victim as having done something wrong and instead support them as the victim they are. Police may be more inclined to take a complaint, even pursue a case, understanding that fraud is a criminal act rather than claim it's a civil matter. Prosecutors might respect the impact of financial crime on older adults and take on more cases. And policymakers might get that fraud victims are crime victims and they would do more to address the scourge, maybe even find a means of restitution. And billions of dollars would stay in our economy. Imagine a world where instead of essentially disregarding victims of these crimes, we support them, 
law enforcement investigates their cases, prosecutors send criminals to prison, and lawmakers seek to put an end to the multi-billion dollar fraud industry. Each of us has the power within us to change how we talk and think about victims of financial crimes. And that power begets power. Talk to your family and friends about it. Call it out when you hear someone blaming a scam victim for, quote, being duped. Call your representatives and tell them it's time to do something meaningful to address rampant financial crime. Let's take a page from successful narrative changes like how we see rape as a violent crime now and how we see suicide now as a tragic and preventable loss. Let's change the way we talk about victims of financial crimes. Oh, uh, by the way, remember Kate, our online romance scam victim who lost $39,000 to the fake surgeon in Iraq with the uh, made-up kids? She got up the nerve to tell her sisters who rallied around her and supported her. She didn't get support from the police when she tried to file a report, but that hasn't stopped her from becoming an outspoken ambassador on the issue of financial crimes. Now that's a far better outcome than withering under the weight of shame. Thank you.